It was wonderful. Thank you. Let me tell you a story, uh, start out here. Um, during the long, dark days of uh, COVID um, uh, over the last couple of years, um, when this building was locked down and you had to get an appointment uh, to get in once a week, um, the adoration hound bells would, uh, would practice in the fellowship hall, all masked up, spread apart uh, from each other. And that was a blessing uh, to, uh, to us in the office that uh, they would gather regularly uh, to work on, uh, on their bells and we would hear sounds of familiar ministry in the congregation. So uh, thank you, Shosh, for all of your work uh, through, uh, through that pandemic and, um, and continuing to bless us in worship this morning. Thank you very much. Good to be here this morning, uh, beginning our uh, our summer season. Um, we are launched into the season after Pentecost. To tell you the truth, we're actually Trinity Sunday this morning, which is why I'm in white. Uh, traditionally, we preach on the Trinity uh, in Trinity Sunday, but it uh, we get so involved in our summer uh, series, we hate to give up a week on it. So we're going to be on the water uh, this morning and uh, and looking at texts. Uh, related to the chaos of the sea. So I look forward to sharing that with you uh, this morning. Uh, a few things to bring your attention. Our series uh, this summer is called Summer of Service, and uh, we're inviting you to engage in the task of being the people of God. Um, our world is, uh, is a bit of a mess uh, right now, and, uh, and more than ever in my lifetime, uh, the church being the church, the church engaged in the needs of community, the church uh, intersecting our, our faith and, uh, and our mercy uh, in, the, in the lives and needs of, of others uh, is more necessary. Uh, and so inviting you, uh, look for ways to engage uh, others in your community, to be of service to others, and uh, when you do, uh, you don't have to uh, brag about it, but put a sticker up on the wall just so we can see the activity that is born out of this congregation throughout the summer. You'll find uh, the, the posters and information about that in the narthex uh, this morning and throughout the summer and, uh, and stickers uh, for you as well if you want to just uh, throw one, slap one on, the, on, uh, uh, on that display. That would be wonderful. Um, I also want to uh, remind you that in the summertime, we are streaming uh, uh, every Sunday, but we're only streaming one service, right? The first two Sundays, it's going to be the uh, 9 o'clock service. The, the last two Sundays of the month, it's going to be the 10 uh, 30 service. You don't need to know which one's coming on. But what we are doing is... Uh, both of uh, the services, whichever one we're, uh, we're putting up on the YouTube channel, it's always going to be there at 10.30. So the 9 o'clock service is not being streamed live. It's being recorded and uploaded. And the reason for that is because we want to... Uh, to fit into the pattern of, uh, of your Sunday morning, right? Uh, so it doesn't shift back and forth at either 9 or 10.30. It's always going to be there at 10.30, right? So just encouragement, if you're watching the stream service, do it on your second cup of coffee instead of your first cup of coffee, right? Anticipate it at 10.30, and we will try to live up to the expectation of being there at every 10.30 Sunday morning uh, to share worship with you uh, and look forward to, uh, to doing it. The, uh, the other thing I want to bring to your attention is we have a group of high school uh, students that are heading out on their mission trip. What's the date of that? July 9th. Thank you, Jennifer. I was going to ask John over here, but uh, thank you, uh, uh, Maven of Schedules uh, at church. I appreciate that. Uh, July 9th, they are looking for prayer partners. They always do this uh, so that they go out as, uh, as a part of our community and we travel with them. Uh, in prayer and encouragement uh, while they're gone. So uh, if you could 
uh, on your way out, go over and sign up uh, to be a prayer partner with one of those high school students or one of the leaders going out and, uh, and be a part of, uh, of that wonderful ministry. The last thing that I'm going to um, uh, share with you is not something I'm going to share. Uh, Daryl's going to come up and tell you a little bit uh, about something uh, he is uh, championing uh, in today, actually. Yeah, Daryl. Hopefully it's on. Okay. Uh, so, I always say start off with a good joke. So yesterday, uh, I go to visit a psychic, knock on the door. They say, who is it? So I left. <laughs> so how this is relevant. Today, after the service is over today, I'm teaching a class called Outsmart the Scammers. And every year, 9 million Americans have their Social Security information stolen or their ID stolen. And $36.5 billion is stolen on fraud every year. So. For 30 minutes of your time uh, today after that, we're gonna talk about four of the most popular scams that are out there today and give you some tools in your toolbox on how to recognize when it's a scam uh, and how to prevent yourself from being scammed. So uh, I promise I'll make it valuable. The second most valuable, probably 30 minutes of your day, your sermon today will obviously okay. be the first. Um, but if you can spare 30 minutes, uh, glad to have you. We're gonna do it after both sessions. If you can't make it today, just stop by. I'll give you my card, be happy to Right. connect with you one-on-one -on -one at some time yeah. and teach you the same class. We may look to see, to do this again uh, after the beginning of the school year, but I, I so appreciate you doing this, Daryl, and uh, your faithfulness to the congregation to be a support to them. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Let's, uh, let's stand and uh, we're going to begin our service with, um, with an order of uh, confession and forgiveness. And then we begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another, and I'll invite you to kneel as you are comfortably able. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus has given his son, Jesus Christ, uh, to die for our sins. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a member of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's stand together and sing our opening hymn.
in, our, uh, in your red book. I invite you and encourage you actually to have the book open. Uh, even if you don't uh, read music, uh, when the notes go up, uh, you go up in your voice and uh, it helps to kind of uh, read that out. We are uh, singing a new uh, glory to God this morning. I'm gonna have Chris sing the chorus for you once through, and then we're gonna do the rest of the liturgy, the curia and so forth, so that when you come into the glory to God, you'll be able to sing the chorus as well. He's gonna sing the verses. Sorry about that, Chris, all by himself, but uh, uh, at least until we get to know it, but we'll, uh, we'll sing the verses with him. Thank you, Chris. Let's, uh, let's hear that. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you.
prayer of the day. God of heaven and earth, before the foundation of the universe and the beginning of time, you are triune God, author of creation, eternal word of salvation, life-giving spirit of wisdom, guide us to all truth by your spirit, that we may proclaim all that Christ has revealed and rejoice in the glory he shares with us. Glory and praise to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. There we are. Hi. Hi, I'm Janae. I'm the Minister of Family Life at St. Matthew. Everyone say that together. Minister of Family Life. No one knows what I do here. Um, I'm just kidding. Look at you. Oh, here, wait. Go slowly. No, you can come up. Oh, it's okay. It's not quite time for all the kids, but you can sit with them if you want, because they're nice big kids. Yeah, it's kind of big kid time. Um, these are just two of the, it's fifth grade together in faith. Um, that's the last time I'll call you guys that. You're, good, you're glad of that, huh? Yeah. Um, fifth graders just finished together in faith. But before I do that, because I have a mic in my hand, I want you to notice the shirt I'm wearing. VBS is coming. You're aware of this, right? There's a rounder out there if you want to donate some things. Um, even if you are my age or older than me, you can come have fun at VBS. It's a secret. We don't tell everyone, but you can. Um, we still need some staff, So, um, and if you're a young person, like these two young people who have volunteered. Uh, we would love to have you. We need some preschool staff. We need some elementary staff. And we would love to have some security for some obvious reasons. Um, you don't have to tackle anyone. Um, but just some presence walking around. If you like have a, and a friend want to come spend a few hours on the mornings and walk the building, I'll buy your coffee. Good coffee. Anyway, OK, that's the end of that. Hi, you guys. They have finished fifth grade. They are finished with their elementary program at St. Matthew. Um, <laughs> yay. Um, and in fifth grade together in faith, we gave them all kinds of things to do. Um, so they have a little challenge this summer because we talked about how um, now that they're moving into our middle school program, part of their faith formation is now on their shoulders more. Um, that we will continue to walk with them, but um, it's more their job now to uh, work on their faith, work out their faith, as the Apostle Paul talks about um, doing. And so we gave them some resources for that. You also know I'm wearing my button jacket. Do you see I'm wearing my button jacket? We're going to give you a cross like this today. Years ago, a man named Paul Hill was, um, he's a pastor, and he was here working with the staff, and he, he used to wear a cross around his neck all the time. Like I have one on right now. Um, and he talked about when he was at a store once, a young woman who was helping him um, said, do you practice to him? It's like, what? Do you practice? And he said, you know, she was wondering if I was just wearing that because it was cool fashion. It was kind of cool fashion at the time. Um, or if I was actually a practicing follower. Um, and so, you know, this is a way I identify who I am. Um, and I wear this around, and it might open some conversation. But some things like that sometimes help us think about as I go out, not just as I'm here on Sunday, right, how I live my faith. Um, so we're going to give you one of those, and then I have some other buttons, like this one says grace. That sometimes opens some conversations, like, is that your name? 
so we can talk about grace. So we're going to give you those. And then we ask each of the kids with the adult with, that was with them to write a family faith plan. And so we framed those for you. So we'll give you those. But first, should we do our verse? They also memorized a Bible verse. You can do it without me, right? You guys know it. What is it? You can do it with us. It's easy. This is Jesus. Okay, here we go. Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and people. All right. Can you turn me back on, Parker? I'll stand farther from them. Sorry. How's the feedback? Um, so. You are no longer fifth graders. You are officially sixth graders now. Would you please give them a hand and welcome to the middle school program. You guys can stay up if you want. I'm gonna invite the rest of the children to come up and uh, join me up here. Come on kids, come on. How's summer starting out for everyone? Good. Good so far? Oh, I like this little pin. Look at that. Look at a little hat on your head. That's wonderful. I like that. Good, good, good. I um, have already been very active in summer session and uh, activities. I've uh, had a couple of vacations, believe it or not, already. That's, uh, I think I'm about done, though. I'm exhausted from all my vacations. I need a vacation from my vacation. Um, have any of you ever been on a boat? Yes? Okay. Any of you been on a small boat, like a canoe or a rowboat? Okay. Did you find that a little scary at first time when you got on a small boat? No? You're okay? You're okay? Okay. Okay. A little scary. Yeah. Yep. Sometimes, you know, small boats can be a little scarier than big boats because they feel everything, right? Once uh, my, I have a canoe, and I it, it used to take my kids out fishing in the canoe. And one time, I was in the boat, and I, you know, I'm holding onto the pier to keep it steady for the kids to step into it. My daughter, um, who's the youngest in the family and probably... Uh, 70 pounds lighter than I am, stepped on the rail instead of on the bottom of the boat like she was supposed to. And guess what happened? She dumped me right in the water. She just flipped that boat right over. That was a very short fishing trip uh, for us. That's right. So that's sort of what can happen with boats, right? Boats are a little, uh, little dicey and they feel things differently than when you're standing on solid ground, and they can be a little scary at times, right? And that's sort of, that's sort of uh, how life is. Sometimes life can get a little rocky, right? Sometimes it can get like it's not as solid as it should be. Sometimes you're feeling all the waves and all the uncertainty, all the chaos around you. But the important thing to know is that God's with us even when things don't feel completely right, right? God's with us in the midst of the difficult times as well as in the midst of the good times, and that's important for us to remember. We're going to talk about that this morning. We're going to talk about stories with boats in them and uh, the uncertainty that that brings to those lives. But uh, let's pray about uh, our own uncertainty, okay? Lord, we thank you that storms may come and storms may go, but you will always be there. You will always be faithful. You will always be with us. You will always uh, provide us courage and, uh, and direction and, uh, and faithful care and compassion. We thank you that you are such a good God to all of us. And all these things we pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Thank you for coming up. Thank you for being here this morning.
reading from Jonah, the first chapter. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and such a mighty storm came upon the sea that the ship was threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried to his God. They threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. Jonah, meanwhile, had gone down into the hold of the ship and laid down and was fast asleep. The captain came and said to him, What are you doing sound asleep? Get up and call on your God. Perhaps the God will spare us a thought so that we do not perish. The sailors said, the sailors said to one another, Come, let us cast lots so that we may know on whose account this calamity has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us why this calamity has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And what people are you? I am a Hebrew, he replied. I, am wor I worship the Lord, the God of the heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were even more afraid and said to him, What is it that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them so. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you, to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea was growing more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great storm has come upon you. Here ends the reading. The second lesson is from Acts, the 27th chapter. We were being pounded by the storm so violently that on the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. And on the third day, with their own hands, they threw the ship's tackle overboard. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest raged, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul then stood up among them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete, and there, boy, <laughs> avoided this damage and loss. I encourage you now to keep up your courage, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For last night there stood by me an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before the emperor, and indeed God has granted safety for all those who are sailing with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told, but we will have to run aground on some island. When the fourteenth night had come, as we were drifting across the Sea of Adria, about midnight, the soldiers suspected that they were nearing land. So they took soundings and found twenty fathoms. A little farther on, they took soundings again and found fifteen fathoms. Fearing that we might run on the rocks, they let down four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. But when the sailors tried to escape from the ship and had lowered the boat into the sea on the pretext of putting out anchors from the bow, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the boat and set it adrift. Just before daybreak, Paul urged all of them to take some food, saying, Today is the fourteenth day that you have been in suspense and remaining without food, having eaten nothing. Therefore I urge you to take some food, for it will help you survive, for none of you will lose a hair from your heads. After he had said this, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of all. He broke it and began to eat. Then all of them were encouraged and took food for themselves. We were in all 276 persons in the ship. After they had satisfied their hunger, they lightened the ship by throwing the wheat into the sea. Here ends the reading. Please stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the eighth chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. A windstorm arose on the sea, 
so great that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but he was asleep. And they went and woke him up, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, you of little faith? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a dead calm. They were amazed, saying, What sort of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Grace to you in peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. I probably should uh, check that everyone's okay this morning. Anyone feeling a little seasick from uh, our text this morning? Do I need to locate any drama? I mean, before we continue, that's my question. You're okay? Everyone all right? Okay. Uh, I should probably say also that... Um, uh, uh, the Hebrew people were not a seafaring people. In fact, if you exclude Noah uh, uh, from our consideration, the, the texts that we read this morning are, are almost like the sum total of, of mariner texts in scripture, right? Uh, I mean, Jesus has several stories uh, of, of himself and, and the disciples uh, on the water, but they're all very similar to each other, and they all generally indicate the Hebrew sense that the water is chaotic and unpredictable, and it's best to stay on solid ground. That's just the Hebrew mindset. And so you might be wondering, well, uh, why, are we, uh, why are we looking at all of these stories? Why are we wrapping up uh, all of these forlorn uh, nautical disasters into one sermon this morning? Well, actually, it, it, it's kind of silly. Uh, when it was first uh, proposed that, uh, that our summer sermon series uh, have the image of a life preserver and the acronym SOS uh, applied to it, uh, Dr. Amy immediately suggested, well, we should, we should preach Paul's shipwreck at the end of the book of Acts. She, of course, was joking because that has nothing to do with summer of service. I, of course, took it as a personal challenge. So <laughs> welcome to my, my challenge. Uh, the theme, actually, uh, summer of service, uh, in spite of the fact SOS is just incidental uh, to it, uh, it does have some connection uh, to these stories, and, and particularly the sense of, of, of service and, and faith, right? And they're probably, uh, uh, probably best characterized or comes, come into clearest focus uh, with the similarities and the contrasts between the story of Jonah and the story of Paul, right? So let's look at that. Both of those men, both of those faithful saints were sent to speak to empires, were they not? Both of them had good reason not to go. 
But their response was exactly opposite from each other. Let's start with Jonah. Jonah was told by God to go to Nineveh. Nineveh was the capital city of the empire of Assyria. And Jonah did not want to go. God had sent him to preach repentance to that city. Jonah did not want them to repent. Jonah wanted God's wrath to fall on the city of Nineveh and to wipe it out. So repentance would be counterproductive. So Jonah got on a boat to go the opposite direction. The opposite direction. He is a servant of God that does not want to serve God when God's will does not reflect his preference. The section that we read this morning reflects the crisis of Jonah's condition. When the mariners uh, uh, piloting Jonah's ship finally realize that he is the cause of their crisis, Jonah can't help but act in his nature. He has been found out. He has regard for the men on the ship. And so when they come to him and ask what they should do to, uh, uh, to save uh, the ship, he says to them, actually, give me that first text. He says to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea, for I know it is because of me that this great storm has come upon you. Right. It's a great climax to this uh, little story. It's a great climax because, remember, these were not Israelite sailors. Israelite did not have sailors. Israelites did not like the water. These sailors were Sidonians. They did not pray to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They had no tradition of connection to this God who made the heavens and the seas. In fact, they're praying to every God they can think of before Jonah introduces them to his God. But when Jonah finally begins to act like a prophet, when Jonah finally describes to them the power and the mercy of his God, what do these sailors start to do? They start to pray. They start to pray to the God of Israel. We didn't read it, but verse 14 uh, says it this way. Um, verse 14 says, please, O Lord, whenever you see Lord capitalized in your Old Testament, it is translating the name of Israel's God, Yahweh. So they're using his name to pray to him, right? Please, Yahweh, we pray, do not let us perish on account of this man's life. Do not make us guilty of innocent blood, for you, Yahweh, have done as it pleased you, right? They're actually pleading for the life of Jonah to his God. So, how does this story compare with Paul's story? Well, as I said, the contrast is not in their destination, right? Paul is traveling to an empire as well. He's traveling to Rome. And he is anticipating the potential for negative results when he goes. He has good reason not to go. Paul is going to Rome to be tried by Emperor Nero, who, according to historical uh, tradition, executed Paul somewhere around AD 62. Paul is not certain that the outcome will be good when he goes to Rome. He surely knows the potential of what might happen. But Paul goes anyway. Paul was actually going to Rome because he appealed to Caesar, appealed to the authority of Caesar. Actually, the last verse of the previous chapter has a little 
conversation recorded in it between King Agrippa, who is the king of the Jewish people, and the Roman emperor uh, 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 at that time, or the Roman, I'm sorry, the Roman governor of Judea. And this is the conversation. This man is doing nothing to deserve death or imprisonment and could have been set free if he had not appealed to the emperor. That's Paul they're talking about. Paul appeals to the emperor when the likelihood is that he could have gone free if he had stayed. Paul is going to Rome, not because he expects personal benefit by the trip. Paul is going to Rome because he was called to preach the gospel to all the world. And how better to achieve that than to preach to the emperor himself. Paul is going to Rome because he is a courageous man of God. And the criterion for, pro, for self preservation does not contribute to his calculations for what it means to serve God. Paul says to the church in Philippi before he launches off on this trip, I think I have that text up here. It is my eager expectation, Paul says, my eager expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in any way, but that by my speaking with all boldness, Christ will be exalted now as always in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, living is Christ and dying is gain. It's a powerful contrast, isn't it? Between Jonah and Paul. Here's another contrast. In the story of Jonah, it is clearly indicated that it is God that has sent the storm to redirect the wayward prophet. But the storm that troubles Paul is not an expression of God's anger. It's just a storm, a terrible storm that threatens lives. And if God is working in the midst of Paul's storm, it is to reveal the courage of his service and the redemptive power of his God. God is working through Paul to guard life and to secure the eventual arrival at his destination. And that, my friends, is a good lesson for us to take into account. More often than not, the events of chaos, like Paul's storm, are not the language of God. They're just the context in which God meets us, connects to our lives. In the midst of the storm, God is there granting gifts to supply us with holy presence and the courage to reject the fear and selfishness. It is our impulse as humans. It's good news because there is much chaos in our world right now, chaos that has roiled the condition for our national comfort and our acceptance of one another. And God is there in the midst of the storm, calling us into service. The pandemic in particular left us with a peculiar challenge. Over the past two years, we have been called into service, service that dictated that we stay home, not be around one another, not talk face to face, not embrace with compassionate hugs, even not come to church. And all of that was necessary and good. 
but those actions are all counter to the nature of being the church. Belonging to each other is the natural state of Christian faith. It's the natural state of what it means to serve God. The SOS of our nation's recent storms have all left us clinging to our life preservers afloat alone in the chaos of difficult times. But God is in the midst of the storm. God is inviting us now to renew our identity of service and care for community, for each other, and for all the needs of our world. And it's why we're inviting you this summer to be intentional about seeking out ways to bless your neighbor, to work for gracious belonging, to heal our planet, our community, our nation. It's the call of the Christian life. It's the call of what it means to be a church. It's the call for St. Matthew, now and always. Amen. Let's stand together and confess our faith. In the words of the Apostles' Creed, we confess, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Will you greet one another this morning with that blessing of peace?
Let's stand as we are comfortably able and share in our closing prayers. Lord, we gather our hearts together as a people of God. We are, we are born into faith in the gift of baptism as, uh, as individuals uh, blessed by, by name and by intention, by water and by word. But we are born into a community that gathers us as a single body, belonging to you and representing your purpose, your calling, your service into the world. Lord, send us. Send us again, Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for, uh, for the font of every blessing uh, that pours uh, into uh, the world. We pray for uh, the grace um, to, uh, uh, to respond uh, to the needs around us. Um, Lord, give us eyes um, to recognize those in need. Give us, uh, give us hearts of compassion uh, to see and to bless. Uh, we pray for, uh, for a world that is uh, so in need and so much in darkness uh, at times. Or we pray for our city and for our community. We pray for uh, uh, redemption and, uh, and the mercy uh, that we meet in you uh, active in our lives. We, we pray for our, uh, our world as Lord, well, Lord. We pray for uh, the people of uh, uh, Ukraine as they meet the tests of, uh, of the war that has been uh, brought into their lives, into their communities, their cities, Lord, uh, grant peace and um, renew justice in that nation, Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for, uh, uh, for the, the season of uh, this uh, summer, uh, blessed with warm weather and opportunities uh, to uh, find joy in it. Um, Lord, we pray for our families and, and the gift uh, to discover and bless them. We pray for um, the losses that we have, um, have met throughout this season of COVID. We pray that you would renew and clarify uh, the grace that, uh, that blesses us in life and even uh, the grace that captures, blesses us, and loves us into eternity for all those that we have lost. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, our Savior, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's sing our closing hymn.
Go in peace, serve the Lord.